the first time we're introduced to this character, he quite literally is taking on an angry mob single-handedly, all because of the fact that one angry freedom fighter threw a rock at a portrait of King George. That's it. That caused this motherfucker to leap over a fence covered in barbed wire with a stick and just start beating the shit out of everyone. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Kind, and join my fellow co-host and filmmaker, John Woolscroft. It should stand for really, really radical. Or I was going to say... It should be called not to, not to, or nacho, nacho, depending on kind of how you want to roll it with it. Because that song was stuck in my head for like a good day. I, it made me hungry <laughs> for nachos. <I'm> not- <laughs> nacho, nacho. I don't dance. But but yeah, we are on episode 304. And this week, um, we're doing our first Bollywood or Tollywood film. I think it's called Tollywood. I think that's what, what they call it. And that is, of course, the 2022 film RRR, also known as Riot, Roar, and Revolt. I got to say, it takes a lot of balls for your opening title card to come 40 minutes into a movie. <laughs> that takes. <laughs> A sack. <laughs> you know, when I when I first watched this, John, I was like, I was like, all right, you know, why why is it taking you twenty minutes to get to the title? And I'm just like, why why do we need to have R for the story and R for the fire and R for the water? But I'm just like, all right, you sold me after the twenty minutes. Yeah, I I would agree with that because when I went to watch this um, for the first time last night. And when I saw that it was three hours and seven minutes, I was like, "Uh, I'm going to probably watch this in two chunks. No, and it, you know, nothing against the movie. I hadn't seen it. I knew nothing of it, but I'm like three hours. That's that's a commitment. Um, but yeah, I did not leave my seat. I watched this thing all the way through. I, I very much enjoyed it. I think I had, you know, some issues with it. I'm sh- sure you did, too. We'll get into that um, through our review. But like. I thought it was very uh, like Shakespearean and they surprised the hell out of me with, you know, and we'll, we'll break this down a little bit more about how like two enemies are become friends accidentally. I'm like, Oh, that's a very interesting take on this story. And yeah, I was glued to it and I, I didn't look away. Yeah. I very much was in the same boat. Now, unfortunately I did have to watch this in two chunks. So, yeah, shame on me. Um, I wish I didn't, but I just, again, I got to like, you know, half, an hour and a half in. I was like, I got to go to bed. <laughs> um, but I <laughs> well, that, loved that's it. That's life stuff, Brian. That's, but I, yeah. I absolutely loved the film um, and was glued to my seat. Like, I was literally like, like I, I got to watch this. Like, and, like, I did watch it dubbed, so that might have been helpful. But at the same time, like I, I found out about this film um, from my brother, my brother, Tyler. He had talked to me about this movie, I'd say probably a year ago. And I was like, eh, we really don't review Bollywood films. It's just not kind of the thing. And I'm not, I, I just I've never really had an interest in the films. It's nothing against them. I just personally, you know, I've never really been exposed to Bollywood films. So, you know, I, I didn't think much of it. Um, but you know, he talked to me about it again because I was talking about how on our YouTube channel, after we did our, our Instagram and YouTube short, um, dealing with, uh, the actress Avantika in Mean Girls, we got a massive influx of new listeners and new subscribers from India. So I was like, you know what? Thank Why you. We not? love you all. Thank you. We love you. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. I love the fact that we're reaching people outside of America, because honestly, you know, I, I, I want this podcast to, to be, you know, accepted by everybody, you know, and, and viewed by everyone. So, you know, except I, me, yeah, except yeah, those guys. Um, <laughs> but I was like, you know what? 
we've got this new audience. I want to do something for that audience. And, you know, I know that that RRR seems like an awesome film. I saw the trailer for it. My brother told me about it. I'm like, I'm going to go watch it. And so, like, I posed it to John. I was like, John, do you want to do this? And he's like, I've heard about this, but I've never seen it. So it just kind of was like, hey, well, why don't we cover it? So I, I was blown away by it. Absolutely blown away by the film. And I understand now why my brother was just like, it's so fucking good. It's amazing. It's almost like good art is just good art, no matter who makes it. And you know what and the thing is, John? It's original. Mm -hmm. It's an original movie. And can we yeah. just can we just talk about really quickly here uh, the money of movies? Absolutely. We could talk about the money of movies. This movie costs, I think, like, I can't remember the exact number of the time, but this movie costs like fifty seven million dollars. I make. think I saw it was seventy five million. Okay. But still, let's well, not well, let's lie. go. Let's go with seventy five. Yeah. Um, this movie is, is gorgeous, and you know there are sometimes like, a few special effect shots don't work, or sometimes like the uh, the rendering of animals doesn't come off completely realistic. But actually, I prefer something like that because if animals are going to be hurt in a movie i don't want them to look too realistic but that's a personal thing for me um but for the most part it works gorgeously and the fact that they made this epic three-hour movie that for the most part with a few exceptions looks immaculate really speaks to the bullshit overhead of american movies oh i know right the fact that i heard that recently dwayne johnson um is getting something like 28 million dollars to be in a netflix movie and that was like that was like the whole budget for like the 1977 new hope that dwayne johnson costs as much as a star war <laughs> and it's like a star war <laughs> so, yeah please explain to me how indiana jones 5 costs 300 million dollars and this movie costs 75 million dollars please i don't i would love somebody in Hollywood to explain to me how this is and I can't do math that easily. So let's just say people will laugh at me if I'm wrong, but like one six or one fifth, you know, the cost of Indiana Jones five and it looks probably better. Oh, it absolutely looks better. It's it's a gorgeous movie. And the thing is, is I always go off on the visual effects of a film and don't get me wrong. There's some moments when the visual effects are just like, eh, but by and large, these visual effects are at times on par or better than Hollywood visual effects. Like I was completely blown away by a lot of the fire shots, uh, a lot of even the animal shots, even though, yes, the animals are clearly CGI, but they don't look like cheaply made. They look like professionally made CGI. Um, and it was an absolutely gorgeous film absolutely and you know it's funny that they said this is the most expensive you know uh film ever made in india it's like <laughs> you don't understand what it's like to be over here and uh, uh us westerners <laughs> we'll yeah. blow 300 dollars on an 80 year old man farting in a cave you know <laughs> we, we will yeah. we will or we'll we'll spend a crap ton of money to to make him look like he's you know 40 years old again that's what we'll yeah. do um but i before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the movie, uh, I want to first give a synopsis for it. Okay, We usually don't do these, but I want to because, you know, it's, it's good to, to just see what the, the general film is about before we get into it. So the, the synopsis for the movie is a fearless warrior on a perilous mission comes face to face with a steely cop serving British forces in this epic saga set in pre-independent India. And yes, that doesn't tell you a whole lot which I love. <laughs> it tells love you that. enough yeah, to, to get to get intertwined in it because I didn't read any type of synopsis and I thought that and he is our, our hero, but it takes a long time to realize that. So I realize that I'm going to say something kind of contradictory here. I thought, you know, the officer um, who's of Indian descent working for the British government going and beating the piss out of you know people that are just desperately wanting to be free i'm like is this our hero 
you know um and then the movie takes many twists and turns where yes he is our hero but we'll, we'll get there eventually but i'm like i thought like oh this is the introduction to our protagonist and i didn't realize that it was an introduction to what i would call our false antagonist um uh, and then but i love those things i yeah. love it when movies do that though yeah and you don't see that a lot in films where you're basically baiting and switching the audience you know what i mean like mm -hmm. through three three quarters of the film you have this idea of who these characters are and three quarters of the movie in they change it up on you and you're just like holy shit is this what a what a movie's like that actually respects their audience enough to subvert their expectations in real time you know what i mean yeah i th i think it was and my apologies for for jumping ahead for anybody that hasn't seen this movie and i want to tell you spoilers you're gonna hear oh yeah there's a lot spoilers, of spoilers not the wazoo is that when the what we think at the time are our protagonists and antagonists who don't know each other become friends i'm like that's captivating that's interesting mm -hmm. i'm like mm -hmm. that's when the movie really i mean i was enjoying it but some of the more cartoony things like i didn't overly care for i know some people probably I fucking love loved them i fucking uh, loved it <laughs> loved all of it it just it, but, you know what it was it's 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 live action dragon ball z the way it should be <laughs> <laughs> oh. but, but when that hit i'm like how fascinating and then yeah. i was like really just grab the popcorn you know yeah. <laughs> i'm in so, for the ride i uh, before we get into this i did want to mention that this movie is an oscar uh, award-winning film um like suicide squad no fuck 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 <laughs> fuck come on really <laughs> really you're gonna go there but yes <laughs> like suicide squad shut up um so this one the 2023 oscar for Best Achievement in Music, written for Motion Pictures, original song. And uh, it was the song Natu Natu, which that song will get stuck in your head so fast. And man, it's so good. I never thought I'd be like riveted by Bollywood dancing in a scene. But Jesus Christ, that scene is so awesome. You know, I, I love Bollywood endings to movies that like I've well, always this said. The, this isn't the ending. This is in the middle of the movie. Right. Well, I guess, yeah, I should I should clarify that, like, usually there's a big dance number at the end of Bollywood productions. This is, yeah, like right in the heart of the movie, I think right around the halfway mark. But um, yeah, it's right that, around the halfway mark is that for comedies, I always wanted to, like, just end in a big musical number because I've always just been so entranced by <laughs> those musical numbers. But yeah, this is this is pretty great. And Brian, I have to admit, like you. I did watch it dubbed because yeah. I really said it was three hours and I wanted to focus on the filmmaking yeah. and not just be reading the whole time. So for all of you purists out there, I'm sorry, but I wanted yeah. to make sure that I caught everything about the filmmaking process. So and the dubbing was actually I, 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 I was kind of surprised by the dubbing because I've seen some and this was available on Netflix, but I've seen some that are not exactly the greatest. Um, and this one was was pretty well done. So, John, I I before we get into this, I did want to take a quick look at some some good reviews and some bad reviews. And I did a little digging and found a couple here. Um, intriguing. Okay. Yeah. Intriguing. Intriguing. So let's go ahead and look at this first one here. Let's read this out loud here, because, again, I know that our audience likes it when we do these these live review things here. So let's bring them up here. So this first one says a movie largely about loving your bro and going beast mode through thick and thin. Everyone else dropping this year can pack it up. You are not topping this. I tend to agree. <laughs> uh, you know what? That sounds like a review from PC principal and South Park. This is a movie about being bros. It being bros. Loving each other. Uh, yeah. Everyone else can pack it up because this is a, this is the movie that we need. <laughs> <laughs> it's the movie we need. It's a movie we deserve. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I mean, it, it's this movie is very much about manly, manly love and um, manly can, love and overcoming odds. Can we talk about real quick here? I, yeah. Just because I want to mention that before we go to the next review difference in uh, culture. What I found mm -hmm. 
because when I was watching this, I found it to be deeply, deeply homoerotic, like very underscore seriously of homoeroticism. Yeah, like you know, may possibly, um, m- well, most likely unintentionally, but uh, apparently, I I did some research on this, and Western audiences tend to agree with me. Where, uh, but uh, more Indian audiences, you know, who the film was primarily made for, went like. You just don't understand Indian culture and Indian friendship and brotherhood. And it's kind of ridiculous that you would read that into it. So I really think it's the difference between, you know, India as compared to the West. Interesting. I don't I didn't read it as homoerotic. Um, just, it, it didn't didn't come across me that way. But I guess my question to you, John, is do you think that our history of, I don't know, uh, kind of shitting over same sex relationships might have something to do with it. It, it, you mean as a society, right? As a society. Yeah. Yes. Not, that's what I mean. Not us not, personally. Not to you and I. No, no. But I'm just saying in general, <laughs> but, as a society, Western audiences have historically, uh, kind of really discriminated against, uh, homosexual relationships do you think that's had something to do with it i do um but i also found some articles written by those in the lgbtq community that said that they felt that there were underlying you know uh homoerotic undertones to the movie um so it's not just coming from like you know straight dudes who are scared and going <laughs> this guy it's gay you know um because they're insecure about themselves and uh, hello doc um, but, <laughs> but, you know, so it, it is coming from, you know, people in, in the community as well. But again, I think that that's welcome to Western civilization as compared to, you know, others. I, I mean, for me, I, I didn't read it that way, although I can see where, where some might, I really do. I, I, I read it more as like, these two have a bond um a a close friendship but that's it it's like like brotherhood that's kind of the way i viewed it um but i can't see where you might find that especially the scene where like beam is like saying he's going to kill every fucking british officer for raju i'm just like okay a little extreme there buddy but okay <laughs> um so with that said you know, manly bro ship is, is is big in this movie. Let's look at review number two here, okay? Yeah. So review number two, we have RRR is the best action movie of the year, the best musical of the year, the best romantic comedy of the year, the best historical drama of the year, and the best movie ever made about fighting colonialism with dance battles and armies of rampaging animals, and most of all, friendship okay i I will say that like the first couple of lines are fairly debatable if you want to debate them but that last line there's no way you can argue with that you can't can't argue about that this is the only movie that has all those things it's like the lunchables (laughs) of a movie it's like it has all the ingredients yeah are you saying RRR is the Lunchables of a film? No, no, I, I can't because lunch, even when I was a kid, before I had any palate worth a damn, I'm like, Lunchables are gross. Hey, I never got them. I never understood them. I mean, I, I did to some extent, but not not to not to that extent. I mean, I, I my no. my kids, they they love Lunchables. I don't see it, especially like I'll grow out of it. The ham. <laughs> like, you ever see the ham in there? It's just like really nasty Ugh. and nasty. nasty. The only thing worse is bagel bites. I like bagel bites. I don't have a problem with bagel bites. All right. Well, then I won't say that bagel bites can go straight to hell. <laughs> what about pizza rolls? What about what's your thoughts on pizza rolls? You know what? I don't know if it's nostalgia or what it is, but uh, I I am a pizza roll guy. You're a pizza roll guy, especially if like if I'm if I'm hammered, give me them pizza rolls with ranch all day, every day. <laughs> give me a hundred of them. <laughs> then- what you do? You bite. You gotta bite the corner, Brian. And is I, that I what you do? We said we, we aren't going to go in that many tangents. We got to bite It's the okay. It's okay. And you got to let that steam come out a little bit. And then you dip it in the ranch. And the ranch gets into the pizza roll and cools it down just enough that you can scarf it without having to wait all day. 
it's this is a moment of a tangent <laughs> yeah. with your uncle john <laughs> come with um, me kids it's your uncle john <laughs> it's your uncle john <laughs> you kids want to sip my beer don't tell your pop <laughs> oh shit well uh let's look at some bad reviews john we looked at some good ones this should let's be some should terrible be ones because this is not a you can't say this is a bad. You could say it's it was, not your taste, but it's not it was a bad film. very hard for yeah. me to find bad reviews on this movie. Yeah, like I think this movie has like a ninety-five on Rotten Tomatoes for whatever the fuck that means. But yeah. like, it was very difficult for me to find bad ones. So let's take a look at a couple of these here. So our first bad review, which of course I didn't swap. Oh, that's why. Our first bad review is the fourth R in the title might have been repetitive as this popcorn or its Indian equivalent action picture runs out of gas an hour before it runs out of movie. Okay. As this popcorn or Indian equivalent, like that seems like there's like a little harsh, a little passive, a little uh, passive, uh, aggressive race of aggression, (laughs) passive race. of. I mean, I I'd say so because how many times have you watched a movie, <clears throat> Fast and Furious, um, where you just have everything jam packed in, and th- there's no plot at all, there's you, no drama at all. Well, uh, Brian, as we all know, there's no popcorn in India. No, no, there can't possibly be. There can, and there can't be any Indian food in America. I can't go on McKnight Road down the road, uh, three minutes from my house, and find Taj Mahal, the Indian buffet food buffet no you, you know. can't no no never. no never you know so yeah i thought that was a kind of a weird thing like i could understand just to play devil's advocate to the guy i could see if if action movies aren't your thing let's say that um then having all of these action sequences for three hours is going to kind of start to to wear on you so i think it's it's audience specific where like for me being a fan of professional wrestling, don't judge me, Internet. Um, I don't judge you at all. Is that you know I I see different types of matches, whether it's a all the rules match or no disqualification or steel cage or you know or it ha- you know the fight takes place in the part. I mean like ooh all these different variations and stipulations. While if I was forcing somebody to watch it with me that hates professional wrestling, it's like. It's just another stupid goddamn match. This show's never going to end. So that's I me. think it's that's me. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's yeah, that's the taste of the audience. So if you're not in to a bunch of action sequences, I could see how this could start to grade on you after a while. But for somebody like me, I'm like, yeah, let's go. You know, I just think that guy is just a hateful bastard. I like that his name is Roger Moore. Is that his real name or it's is probably that like his real tongue name. in cheek? It's probably okay. his real name. He probably probably hates that name. <laughs> because like everyone's just like, oh, hey, James Bond, where the fuck you going today? Yeah. So I guess yeah. there are worse characters to be connected to. Like if your character was Booger, like the same name as Booger from Revenge of the Nerds. So. Do you know anyone who's named is Booger? Uh, well, I meant the character has an actual name in the movie. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm just saying, like, I don't know anyone who's named Booger. <laughs> That's I like guess, your your parents must really hate your guts. If they I guess you that. we have we have some professors uh, Chatham who knew Booger. We could see if they could reach out to him and ask. Oh god! <laughs> oh god! Yeah. All right, let's get to our last terrible review. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this one right here says: bikes are tossed, bombs are tossed, Brits are tossed. RRR throws so much from all directions, and yet I left the theater feeling nothing ouch that is rough very so, rough here's where i i like to break down the idea of film criticism as compared as compared to film like taste or emotion is that you leaving the theater feeling nothing and i i'm sure if you go back through our 300 odd episodes you'll hear me say that constantly but there's a difference between how something emotionally impacts you as compared to actual true film criticism Mm -hmm. and i mean this is just a person who put the review online so i'm not i'm not you know putting them on trial here like everybody has the right 
to put the review up and and thank you for putting your review up and being honest but just like you feeling nothing doesn't mean that the film didn't narratively meet its purpose that's very true that's very true no it's true it's true i i mean for me I, i i i go back to there are some movies that i don't really feel anything for that a lot of people say oh yeah 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 i I feel really impactful by this. Um, you know, a lot of people I remember back in the day, Titanic was a movie that they were like, oh, I have so much feelings and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I, I didn't. Either. But that but I, I can't also. And this is maybe because I am trained to look at film in a different way than just by pure emotion that I can see the technical merits of a movie like Titanic, even though I personally don't have an emotional connection to it. Right. Like that's, and I think that you can't take that away from this movie. You know, there right. Hollywood has such a stranglehold over entertainment that when I see a movie like RRR come out and blow Hollywood's expectations out of the fucking water, I root for them. Well, Brian, I got a more a more recent one because um, we talked um, m- might have been 2019 on movies that we love that everybody else hates and yeah. movies that we hate that everybody else. Loves. And I said that I don't dislike this movie. I just don't understand why it's so beloved. And I hate to say this uh, for our for film to our audience, but. And I and I've watched it over and over again to try to understand. It's no country for old men, and everyone around me who is a filmmaker or a film buff or everything like John, this is a brilliant fucking movie. What the hell is wrong with you? And I I'm like I'm trying I'm trying to get it, but it just doesn't resonate with me. But because it doesn't resonate with me, doesn't mean that it's not a great movie. It's just not a John Wollescroft movie. And that's okay. We can all move on, you know? <laughs> so Damn right. Damn yeah. right. All right. So with that said, let's jump into this film. Let's actually, let's, let's dissect it, if you will. Okay. So it's worth mentioning that these uh, characters are actually based on real historical characters. Um, you know. Uh, I'd say how, rather loosely. But it, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's loosely in their relationship within the film. But in reality, um, you know, Alari Sidrama Raju was a Indian revolutionary along with uh, Komaram Beam. So, like, I'm trying really hard to pronounce these these names. I'm sorry if I if I butchered them. I'm sorry. Really trying hard. Um, but yeah, so like these were real revolutionaries. The biggest thing here and what makes it fictional is that these contemporaries never met. And never had the interaction that we're seeing. It's a complete fictional story with these two historical characters. It's kind of like Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter, right? Like Abraham Lincoln existed. (laughs) Okay. But he never hunted vampires. And that's kind of like this. Okay. That's kind of the way I like to say it. Um, Interesting. Okay. (laughs) I mean, that's one way to put it, right? Like Abraham Lincoln's a historical character, but the man never fucking hunted vampires as far as I know. It's almost like Walt Disney and Hitler. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. you can't go that far. <laughs> That's actually they too never met. Real. But, but yeah, American Nazis. Disney hung out with him. But anyways, yeah. sorry. Anyway, anyways. So uh, the main conflict kind of starts with what I love about this is just talking about Nazis jump. So uh, the actress who played Elsa Schneider in The Last Crusade. She plays like the governess of India or Delhi for it specifically in there. And the whole conflict of the film is centered around Elsa Schneider liking to kidnap little kids from native villages who have musical talents. That's pretty much it. That's what starts off this whole thing. Brian, can I ask you a question? Yes, go ahead. So. I'm not forgiving the English in, in, in no, in any more way than I forgive our history in America of colonization. It's horrific. It's awful. It's deplorable. But 
from a filmmaking perspective where you're supposed to give any character nuance and layers do you think that the english came off as almost comically evil in this hmm um it's hard for me to at all comment on that because one i cannot put myself in the shoes of someone whose colonization was not that long ago mm -hmm. okay like we're talking 1940s that's how long ago it was when they got their independence so like i cannot comment on that i imagine that there still is a great deal of anger and resentment towards the british and rightly so so if their expression of that is to make them comically evil, then more power to them. I look at it as we've done movies with Brown World War II and we've made Nazis comically evil. You know, have you ever seen the TV show Hunters on, I think it's Amazon? Yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware of it, I should say. Yeah. So, like, that show has comically evil Nazis. Okay. And in Indiana Jones movies, they're comically evil Nazis. That's because in our culture, we've made Nazis to be kind of the archetype, or at least it used to be up until 2016, the archetype of what evil is. So, and that's because it's our culture. But I can't say that speaking as someone from India. I just want to say for those that are not watching the video version of this, I just gave Brian the finger wag of approval. Yeah, because like I did. Was I that did, the finger wag of approval or the the I wanted I, ju just a minute? <laughs> no, 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 that was touche, sir. Touche. Yeah, um, sometimes I do that. Is that it's funny because I felt like just watching this as, you know, a man nearing 40. I won't say exactly how close, but, um, you know, from a mature lens, I'm like, oh, this this does play off the villains as and I'm not saying that they shouldn't fuck Britain in this time. Fuck them right in the ass. Uh, so I, I want to say I have no forgiveness for them whatsoever saying this. But to portray them as is so comical. But, you know, Brian, when you mentioned Indiana Jones, I mean, obviously, the wounds in the 1980s, 40 years later, are still fairly fresh for something like that with World War II um, is that, yeah. We're not going to give any nuance to the these Nazis like fuck Nazis. We're going to play them as the most cartoonishly evil people on the goddamn planet. And it's like, I can't I can't enjoy Indiana Jones and say, oh, it's such a perfect movie. And then say, oh, this movie is portraying these people as, you know, kind of over the top. It's it's the same thing. So, um, yeah, good point. Very good point. Yay. I did a good point. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Oh, Brian, um, you do good points all the time, and then I make fart jokes. <laughs> yeah, that's how the show works. That's how the show works. <laughs> so, so speaking of comically evil, I did want to talk about the late, great Ray Stevenson in this, who plays what I would argue as the most frugal villain of all time. <laughs> Gotta this, save that this, money, honey. This motherfucker, he literally is like, don't waste bullets on people. He literally has a line that he says over and over again. He's like, do you know how much that bullet costs? That bullet had to ship from, it was made in England and then it was shipped to here and then it was shipped to your, your, you know, your station and then put into your rifle. So by the time you get the bullet, it costs one pound sterling. Evil. Yeah. And so he's basically saying, like, yeah, just bash him in the head with a stick. Just bash him in the head. Like, horrible shit. But you know what? It makes him really evil. And, uh, like, uh, that particular line comes back multiple times in the movie, and it ends up becoming, spoiler alert, the best line in the fucking film <laughs> towards the end. <laughs> um, and but, yeah, Ray Stevenson, great actor in this. Rest in peace. Um really a great actor all around. I loved Ray Stevenson in Rome. I loved him in Ahsoka. Um, and he did a hell of a job in this film as, as the evil governor Scott. Um, yeah, I forget his last name. <laughs> yeah, but that's fine. But I would say for, for people that watch American movies like me, like 
in the in more recent years where the first act seems like instead of 30 minutes uh you know it takes like five minutes because apparently they need a never-ending second act and you don't really get to know anybody or anything like that like show them this movie and show them this character and this line and because not just because it comes back but how powerful it is to show how evil of a bastard this guy is like this is how you build characters and environment and atmosphere and you know apparently a lot of you know uh western filmmakers uh, and screenwriters have forgot how to do this but uh apparently if you watch rrr you're going to realize how you build up a world damn right damn right john um so with talking about characters let's talk a little bit about our heroes we're going to start off with the most badass of badass Indian police officers ever. And that is Alaris at Rama Raju. Literally every scene this guy is in, he's a fucking badass in all sense of the word. I'm surprised that it's not just like constant shots of his crotch. <laughs> just pulsating. There are a couple yeah. times when there's a constant shot of his crotch. Like there's always up angles, so you are kind of getting like, you know, a crotchal angle there. But, like, the first time we're introduced to this character, he quite literally is taking on an angry mob single-handedly all because of the fact that one angry mob, mobster, I guess what you call him, mobster, or rioter, Freedom fighter. Yeah, freedom fighter. But all because one freedom fighter threw a rock at a portrait of King George. That's it. That caused this motherfucker to leap over a, 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 a fence covered in barbed wire with a stick and just start beating the shit out of everyone to the point where by the end of the 10 minute long battle between one man and a gigantic mob full of, I'd say, what would you say? Like a thousand people? Yeah. Uh, it's comically large. Well, speaking of comically, like th this type of thing, and it's like, uh, John, either join the party or leave. Like, you can't watch Jurassic Park and go, it's stupid. There's dinosaurs in this movie. Um, is that when he leaps like 300 feet over a fence, <laughs> I just yelled out while I was watching, I went, physics. <laughs> John, there are no physics in this movie, okay? These no, both no. both Raju and Beam are superheroes, okay? We all know that, and that's okay. Even I'm the filmmaker said that. When my research on it, they said, really? like, basically, these two superheroes. Yeah, because they are. They absolutely yeah. are superheroes. But yeah, um, so, so Raju works for the Indian government, which is supported by the British Raj, and you get this idea, and this is, of course, after he beats the fuck out of everybody in this, this thing, causes them all to leave. But you get the idea that all he wants is really just to be kind of promoted to the higher office, right? Just wants to get that promotion because there's a scene where literally Raju is sitting at, at and this is after he beats the shit out of all the mob and like he, 700 people, like 700 yeah. people. And he's sitting there wounded at like, you know, some sort of honoring ceremony among officers. And of course, because he is Indian, they just decide like, we're not going to give you a medal because racism. Okay. So you get the idea that, he, you know, this guy is just battling racism and he wants to kind of be promoted above his own station. So I, I think there's also an underlying thing like, you know, that's 99 percent of it. But I'd say one percent of it, too, is that they're fucking afraid of this guy. Oh, yeah. This he, guy is he's, fucking terrifying. Yeah. He, he just beat up like 700 people. So, yeah. He, you know what he kind of reminds me of? He kind of reminds me of El Mariachi. Mm -hmm. You know, like like yeah. he kind of has that mystique of like this guy with one stick could take down everyone and and yeah he might get injured but he's still gonna get up you know? oh so it reminds you of the director who lied about making a movie for seven thousand dollars to get fame yeah yeah you had to go down there didn't you <laughs> you had to do it had to do it that movie um, cost you three hundred thousand dollars you lying <laughs> asshole <laughs> But hey, it, it, you know you can't put this movie cost me three hundred thousand dollars film book and yeah. you sell a book about that, can you? Uh, so yeah, so yeah. Um, so what happens allegedly. is Raj, yeah, allegedly. Sorry, uh, Raju, you had to put that in there. Raju, he sees a chance where he can 
you know, get that promotion and kind of rise above the station because Elsa Schneider gets wind that the village that she kidnapped the child from. Okay. Remember the child that I talked about earlier, how the whole story revolves around this, the village where she kidnapped the child from apparently has a protector or a shepherd as it's referred to in the film who literally will stop at nothing to get the child back. And we don't know who this person is and no one knows who this person is. So Raju literally says, do you want him dead or alive? Again, the most badass thing to say in a movie like this. And so he's on the case to go ahead and find him so that he can rise to a spe- He'll be promoted like special agent or whatever the fuck shit. So that kind of sets up his track. Now we don't know anything else about Raju at this time up until the fact that he's trying to find the shepherd. The shepherd, of course, is Karam Beam. And this man, I kid you not, wrestles tigers for fun in a forest covered in blood. I guess say the man has nice traps and he did not skip deltoid day. Oh my lord, he is beef. This is a like, beef man. Like the he is he is a very buff man. And he, the first shot we get of him, he does himself in blood, runs because he's 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 chased by a wolf and a tiger in the same fucking scene. Like the wolf starts first, then he like, runs into a tiger. Tiger starts going after him next, and the man literally rustles the fucking tiger, throws some sort of knockout gas thing at him, and on top of that, like tries to get him caught in a trap, but. The trap, of course, because it's this type of movie, gets loose. So he has to use his arms to hold the trap closed. It, it, it's show insane. Sec- show a sexy ass torso. Oh, my God. It's fucking insane. And I'm just going like, this is Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> like, like, I know that people complain about the physics of this, but I'm just like, this is fucking Dragon Ball Z. But it's live action. This is what live action Dragon Ball Z is. And I think that's why I personally got it and why I was like there for it, because I'm like, oh, yeah, you watch Dragon Ball Z growing up and you're like, of course. Yeah, of course, you're going to have things like this. But man, oh, man, like it's it's a very crazy scene. But Beam, he is the shepherd and his what he's trying to do is just as I mentioned, he is trying to find Molly, the little girl who got kidnapped. And he does this by disguising himself as a Muslim in Delhi who who works on motorcycles. That's his thing. And you, it's funny because like I for a moment there, John, thought that, that we were seeing like a flashback or something because I'm like, why is this guy who five seconds ago was wrestling tigers and, you know, all that shit? Why is he suddenly like kind of kowtowing to this British officer? I'm like, is this a flashback? Are we seeing like flash? So I, I was a little confused by that, but I understood it after I started watching the movie in its entirety. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he's he's working that undercover game. He's doing the undercover game. He's doing the undercover he game. he could literally like rip this man's heart out and shove it up his ass, but he, he could. But, he, but he's not. Yeah, he's not gonna do it. He's not gonna yeah. do it because I would give over his cover. Yeah. Um, but you know, Raju and Beam all kind of come together because this. Is, by the way, this is all in the first twenty minutes. <laughs> Everything I'm describing. It's before the title card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, we haven't got to the exploding train. I that haven't got explodes because well, it explodes. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah. Was Raju and and Beam come together to form their manly friendship because the most Rube Goldberg of exploding trains <laughs> occurs. Okay, in one sequence, you have Raju who's chasing after some person who is connected to Beam, a friend of his, who's trying to help him find Molly. And a train literally leaks oil because, of course, it does, causes an explosion. A little kid is in the river. The explosion causes fire and shit all around him. So at that moment, without talking at all, all right, let me set the stage for you, without talking at all, Beam and Raju become friends, form a plan to save the child, and of course, use the Indian flag at the same time. It's brilliant. Just simply brilliant. And both of them on their own phallic instruments, one being a horse, one being a motorcycle, they use that big dick energy and all their big dick muscles to big dick save this 
I don't want to finish that sentence to save this kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! But it, this forms a friendship. This forms a friendship and also forms a title card. Okay, it's two men running underwater and then gra- <laughs> gra- grabbing it, or they don't even uh, breathe. No, they just they're just they don't need no, to breathe. They don't need air. Breathing's for mortals, Brian. <laughs> Breathing is for mortals. Oh shit. So what what follows is is this very uncomfortable feeling. You mentioned this earlier in the episode, John, that we the audience know who who Raju is. We know who Beam is. We know that Raju is really trying to find Beam and take him to justice and you know get his promotion. And Beam is trying to find Molly. So it's like we have this expectation in ourselves as we're watching this movie. And through the whole point up until that double cross that happens, you know, we're just like, when, when is the shoe going to drop? And again, I love that because it, it keeps the audience on their edge. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's brilliant by the filmmakers that they didn't portray. um, And Brian, thank you for getting their names, right? the, the, what we think at this time is the antagonist um, portraying him. Raju. Yeah. Raju, like a cartoon character, you know, and it's like to the point where when he becomes a friend, we don't second guess it. It's just kind of like, oh, you know, these two are just normal human beings in different ways trying to make their lives work in this bullshit world that they're in. Uh, both have the same goals. We'll find out later different tactics to pull it off and yeah it was like i kind of got lost in this whole section of the movie of this like you know bromance like where it's you know hey let's help each other out and like we'll both help each other score with chicks (laughs) and just like i'm like this could have been a movie in and of itself i just really enjoy these two getting along and having a good time but there's that underlying dread the whole time of like when does the shoe drop here when does this stop that's what i mean it's like it's we we know it's coming and we know that it's going to be ugly and we know that it's going to be devastating to both of them so it's like the whole time that all these lighthearted moments are happening you're just going oh fuck something bad's gonna happen and it's it's great storytelling on the filmmaker's part it's great acting the acting in this is really good um, Ra- the characters, who, the actors who play Raju and Beam, do a tremendous job in this film. Com- you know, just ex- giving us the audience that inclination that these two are friends and very deep friends, and that that relationship grows. Now, I do want to take a moment and go into some of these memorable scenes because obviously it's a three-hour-long movie, and this review is already already pretty long to begin with. So I want to go through some notable scenes that that I I just think are just great. All right. So the first scene I have here is no, no joke there. The fancy dance party. I mean, if you don't know this movie, this is probably what you do know it from. If yeah. you're like an award show kind of person, like if you don't watch the award shows then maybe you just don't know anything about this movie, but like this won the Oscar and I'm sure it won a bunch of other awards um, because there's a dance number as not to not to or yeah. nacho nacho as you do and uh, uh bollywood films um that is a banger it is a hundred percent a banger hundred percent it, it, it's a good one and um yeah see like i guess like if you've never seen a bollywood film this may take you out of the movie but like i i expected this to happen so i was like okay here we go um and i was along for the ride um but yeah it's it's fantastic and i love in this scene so it's our heroes are out dancing all the white colon uh colonizers and at the very end i love that because our our main protagonist wants to like score with this uh with this woman that his buddy absolutely wingmans it and purposely like falls even though he he still had energy left because he wanted to make his bro look good in front of his lady and i'm like yeah that's a wingman right that's, there that's a bro it's a bromance yeah. man 100 <laughs> percent a bromance yeah. um but i love the fact that the jerky british guy who's trying to to get with jenny 
is just like, ha, you don't know Calypso. You don't know the flamenco. And he's like, but do you know Natu Natu? And he's like, what? And that's when it leads into the dance number, which it is really good. The dancing in it is just tremendous. And I almost feel out for him. I'm like, is this fake? Like, are they, are they digitizing the legs? Because I'm like, I don't know anyone who can move like that. But no, it's not. It's all choreographed. Like, it's it's amazing. Well, there there is often techniques in movies where they will have they will purposely have the background actors move in slow motion so that if they speed up, you know, the actors that are dancing, then it doesn't look like weird. It doesn't look like over the top movements in the background because they were taught to move very slowly so that if they speed it up, they'll look like they're moving in a normal uh, motion in order for them, the dancing to come off as just like this. Wow. Look how fast it's going. Right. But either way, like there is technique and and choreography and golf. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not taking anything away from the actors. They they're, they're fantastic dancers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so outside of the dance number there at the fancy da- dance, there is the the rescue of Molly scene. Okay, so this is where Beam literally he 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 unleashes hell and animals on the the castle where Molly is kept. Brian, I thought this was the I thought this is the end of the movie. And I thought it was too. I had to like take a piss and I paused it. I'm like. There's still an hour and 15 minutes in this movie. <laughs> I I totally was like, wait a minute. This isn't the end? Yeah. <laughs> like, I yeah. know this is what we were building to, but yeah. Um, just batshit chaos in the best way possible. You know, into this British embassy, they just fucking crash hundreds of animals into the party, and there's like fireworks everywhere. And unlike Madam Web, them going off is actually interesting uh so there's explosions and fireworks and animals running amok eating people and it's just like and uh slow motion that i'll tell you that uh dickhead from justice league um wishes that he could do uh zach snyder you know i didn't mind them the the slow motion so much in this one i didn't either no i didn't i didn't because it felt earned in a way that like zach snyder's just felt insulting um that i'm like this scene wow i don't know how anybody could be bored mr rrr the fourth r is repetitive um because how can you be bored a a man throws a leopard at somebody well a man throws a leopard uh uh raju punches a tiger with a flaming torch yeah but by the way everybody uh what the fuck (laughs) who hasn't seen this at love animals the movie specifically puts in the front of the movie because you usually get it at the end of the movie if you watch the credits all the way there they said there are no real animals no animals were hurt in the making of this production please PETA don't come after us all the animals are CGI yeah so well uh, I I mean I kind of figured that but either way like a tiger gets punched in the face by fire (laughs) insane Uh, but this is also the scene where we're Raju and Beam do discover each other and they do fight and it is brutal. Um brutal brutal fight that that goes on for a long time and it 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 erupts honestly. Um and kind of hits you deep in the feels because you said yeah. John this is like a, an hour and a half in and you're just like oh shit. Like like it, it's an insane scene. Um and the repercussions of it come right after, which, you know, one of the scenes that that hit me a lot was was Beam's whipping scene. Well, see, I thought during that that whole fight scene, because I thought you were going to mention how intense it was when, uh, you know, the one character said, if you're not my friend, then you're against me. And then the other character said, you were supposed to destroy the British, not join them. And then they fought on a lava plant. Did I watch the right movie? You didn't watch the right movie. That's, ah, that's, shit. Yeah, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, um, no, oh, but thank that's God, cause that's bad dialogue. But hey, you know, like that's the thing is, is like at no time do Beam or Raju talk during this scene. 
There's maybe like on a one or two lines here or there at the beginning, yeah. at the beginning, and then one or two lines here at the end, and all of it is using, I don't know, acting, show don't tell, action, yeah, 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 yeah. The ferocity of their fighting against each other, like that's the thing, and that's what sells this over something like Revenge of the Sith, right? <laughs> um. But the scene that comes after this that really hit me was Beam being whipped by Raju and sadistic Elsa Schneider. Um, of course, she shows up. Of course, she she's of course she's got the whip that has barbed wire on it, you know, because she was a Nazi in you know uh, <laughs> in last a different crusade, life. yeah, in, in last a different crusade, universe, in a different yeah. universe. So sure, so like she gives Raju, who's forced to whip Beam until he breaks. And Beam's not breaking because the man is a superhero, too. Uh, so he's not going to break. And so Schneider gives this whip with barbed wire on it and starts whipping. And, and Raji starts whipping Beam. And instead of breaking, this guy starts singing and incites a riot. This Okay, so this I was confused about when it first started. Because there's a, a term in filmmaking... Um, or a lot of other mediums as well. It's like, is something diegetic or non-diegetic? And for those that don't know what that means is, is the music supposed to be heard in the world or is the music uh, just soundtrack? Uh, and a lot of times this comes up in musicals. Like, are we supposed to see the musical numbers as almost like fantasy or illusion or do they exist in the world and so i didn't know at first whether he was singing for the audience in a uh non-diegetic way or if he was singing for in the movie like in the universe in a diegetic way so i it took me a minute to understand is this a musical number for the audience or is he singing to the people i think it's a bit of both I really yeah. think it's a bit of both. And I think I think that's okay. I think it works fine for this because the whole idea is that, you know, Beam didn't break. He instead broke into sound and into, into, to, to, to uh, song. And, you know, that's the opposite of what you would expect in a scene like this. And I, I got why it was there. And that actually comes up later that, Raju brings up after we know his true intentions that, you know, instead of a man who's only interested in getting weapons for people, he used his own suffering and song to turn the people into a weapon. Mm. And that's the big thing here that that beam shows Raju in this scene. It interestingly reminds me of an English movie. Uh, v, well, I think America made it, but it's based on a an English graphic novel, V for Vendetta. Yeah. Where <laughs> yeah, uses the you know the uh power of word to to drive the people. Yep. And a power of symbol to drive the people. Um but yeah this is where um and I'm sorry if I'm jumping a little ahead Brian but yeah. where uh shortly after this we find out that like you know the character you know whipping him and stuff like it's actually been a freedom fighter the whole time and I was like what oh yeah Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah. so, yeah. so right after this, we, it, it's revealed that Raju is in essence playing the British government from that the inside. He, yes. And it's brilliant because we get his backstory that his father had trained his village to rise up against the British. But the big problem with them is that they didn't have any weapons. And so Raju's, you know, mission is to arm his village to finally take back their country. And he he views that he will do anything possible, including betray his own people, to serve that purpose. And what Beam's sacrifice does is illustrate that there is there is a limit to that. And that you, in essence, kind of become the villain if you go down that path. Um, which is kind of like, you know, if you live long enough, you see yourself become the villain, like, yeah. like the Dark Knight. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I think that those characters to me are, are so, so fascinating. The ones that have to, to go the darkest route for themselves for the greater good of other people. 
Um, I guess I'm going to just mention Alan Moore again um, with <laughs> Watchmen. You know, yeah. the, the yep. smartest man alive kills millions to save billions. So he has to he has to do the most horrific thing imaginable and he has to live with that the rest of his life for the greater good. And and that type of greater good that could be debated forever. Like if this was our universe, it's a, it's a graphic novel, so we don't really need to debate it. But if we were in that world, like, did he do the right thing or not? You know, and there, there's a difference between you know, Warshack and uh, and that. Uh, sorry for people that don't know Watchmen. I'm just. I think uh, they're fine. I think yeah. they're okay. And it was is it? It's Night Owl, right? Oh well, well Rorschach yeah. is the one who's like. But Rorschach's like fuck this. But Night Owl's kind of like I get why you did it. I don't know. Oh well, and also Doctor Manhattan's like I get it, but I don't yeah. Doctor Manhattan it. is like I get it. I understand it because he can like see in the yeah. future and all sorts of shit. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's the villain that has to sacrifice all of his. Every one of his basic beliefs in order for the end result. And that's that's a fascinating type of character to me. And I, that's why I think I, I like his character more because, like, our main protagonist, like, is is good for the asset. We like he's our like Luke Skywalker. And not that our other characters, our other character would be like if somebody was on the Death Star to sabotage it. But what well, we don't really get. But I'm saying that like he he's very like good and and pure like Luke. Where like this character is like I have to get as dirty as possible to come out clean on the other side. And I think that that's a fascinating type of character trope. Well, well Raju definitely has way more layers to him than I think beam does i don't discount beam i think beam is the heart if anything he he has the heart he you know he gives that heart to raju in a in a way and raju's um, the mind maybe well i, I think i think yeah. raju is is the the mission in a whole because mm -hmm. one thing that beam does is he's not looking at it in terms of i need to save my country he's looking at it in terms of i need to save my village Mm -hmm. And Raju looks at it from, I need to save my country, you know? So like it's, it's macro versus micro. That's the way I kind of looked at it. Fair enough. Um, so, but moving along. Okay. This, again, this is a three hour long movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Raju, we now know his backstory decides he's going to use his new station as he did get, you know, the promotion. Um, to rescue Beam and also rescue uh, Molly. And in doing so, he, in essence, gets captured by the British himself and ends up in a prison where I <laughs> this, this part just makes no sense to me. They literally tell the governor, like, hey, yeah, we got him only eating one piece of bread a day, and they turn to him in his cell, and the guy is literally pulling chains and doing pull-ups and he's ripped as fuck it's cheese brian oh it's i don't care i'm all for it cheese. i am all yeah. for it 100 percent. i'm for it i'm just like his man is fucking goku and that is who he is i don't brian, care <laughs> when a man jumps 300 feet over a fence at the beginning of it, i'm like all logic's out the fucking window here <laughs> i, I well, wish for how I love like, it i wish for how thoughtful this script is and i wish that i could see a version of this that wasn't so over the top in certain areas and i know that that's what people love about this movie so they're probably like john what the fuck are you talking about john what but, the fuck are you talking about <laughs> but just like it's just such a thoughtful script but yeah but we get the thing where he's only eating one moldy piece of bread a day but he's still fucking working out like a jack mass motherfucker big dick energy boop, 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 you know <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. I'm here for it. He's like got this like look of like, I'm going to fuck you up. I don't care if I haven't <laughs> eaten in yeah. in months. I will yeah. still fuck you up. And Ray Stevens like, I want to break him. So he puts him into like an, a solitary confinement and busts his legs up. Um, but don't worry. The busted legs aren't going to matter too much to him in a minute um, because Beam, you know, you know, still thinks Raju is a traitor. And, a, and, you know, is, is evil, but 
because the plot needs to have this happen, uh, Beam ends up crossing paths with Sita, who Sita is Raju's like wife slash girlfriend. We don't know necessarily relationship there. We just know that's the love interest for, for Raju. And Sita kind of just exposes the plot of Raju's backstory. And this is where you get Raj, you know, Beam, who now decides that he is going to no longer think about just his single mission of I need to just rescue Molly for the village. But now is where he he decides he's going to rescue his friend at at all costs. And we get the scene where he rescues uh, Raju by knocking on the ground and Raju's knocking on his cell and following the sound and vibration. Because, again, these people are superheroes. OK, um, that wouldn't work in real life, but whatever. Um, and, and, uh, they then, because Raju's legs are busted to shit, Raju hops on beams shoulders. And I kid you not, they fight British officers like motherfucking Goro in Mortal Kombat. Well, this reminded me also of like guardians of the galaxy. Cause isn't there like in the first one, doesn't like rocket like jump on the back of Groot and they're both firing guns I'm, and stuff. I'm pretty sure that does happen. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. but either way, like it's so weird looking because like you just got you got Raju's torso <laughs> and then you've got Beam's legs and Beam's kicking people and punching people and Raju's punching people and they're climbing like scaffolding as one single solitary unit, which I'm just going like how does it work? But I'm 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 again I'm here for it. It makes well, no sense, but I'm just I'm I'm there. Well, Brian, there here, here's my question: huh. How can a man who can't feel his legs wrap his legs around somebody securely? Don't question it, John. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so they escape, and you know we have to, of course, get Raju back to 100 percent health. And they, of course, because physics don't matter and logic doesn't matter 100% in this movie, we get a scene where, where Beam uses plants in nature to fix Raji's legs. And I here's the way I, I, I sure. thought about this, because I, I watched the pitch, um, what the hell is it, pitch pitch video. Pitch that, meeting? Yeah, pitch Ryan meeting. Ryan George? Yeah, 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 great, great channel. Um, yeah. So I watched pitch meeting, and they brought this up, too. And I just thought to him, like, okay. Here's the thing. This is following Dragon Ball Z logic. And in Dragon Ball Z, there is a, a uh, deus ex machina device used in battles like this called a sensu bean. Okay. I don't know if you remember. If you Did you watch Dragon Ball Z growing up? You know, I like to the failure of all of my friends around me. I just couldn't get into it because every one of my closest friends loved this show. And I like I didn't get it. And I was I was slightly ostracized by my friends because I didn't like Dragon Ball. Z I won't hold it against you. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. But anyway, the sensu bean is kind of just thrown to characters whenever their energy is low and it suddenly like makes their energy high and they can suddenly be back to 100% health. And so kind of, I kind of looked at it as like beam putting these plants on Raju's wounds and making him hundred percent. That's the sensu bean effect. Okay, it's, that's, like a, that's, it's like a video game. It's like the yeah. herb and yes. Resident Evil or yeah. the mushroom yeah. and Mario. Yeah. yeah. And and then with everybody at 100 percent, what then follows is the most epic. I didn't think that they could surpass the beam rescuing Molly scene with the animals. But sure enough, no, we get the best fucking fight scene ever with bow and arrows and fire and spears against British officers and it's like super violent. Like there's a scene where Beam, I kid you not, like takes a spear and shoves it through a tree into the head of another officer. And you see it. And it's one continuous shot. And then there's a scene where he takes a motorcycle. He kicks it and throws it at somebody, causes it to explode. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's action Fucking nuts. It's action madness. And like, if you love it, you love it. Yeah. And I love it. <laughs> oh, my God. It's yeah. insane. And I'm like, is this the end? Are we at the end? No, we're not. Because we, of course, have to deal with the governor and and, you know, Elsa Schneider. OK, so what then proceeds is just, again, 
the most phallic symbols there, a horse and a motorcycle race towards the castle. The governor's like, I want all my platoons. I want to kill these motherfuckers. It's like, you're wasting all these resources that you said, oh, the bullets don't waste them on people. So yeah, he gets his comeuppance because again, a motorcycle is thrown. Don't ask me how, um, at the castle. And of course the castle's filled with TNT causes it to explode. Elsa Schneider gets blown up. The only person left standing is Ray Stevenson and the best fucking sequence. Like I, I'm like, this is the best ending for this whole fucking movie. This is the only way you could end it. And it's Raju and beam beams got weapons for Raju. Cause that was his mission. Get weapons for his village. And beam is like here, I've got a gun. Raj is like, here's a bullet. And he says, he says the same words that Ray Stevenson said at the beginning of the movie. Do you know how much this bullet costs? This bullet costs more. This bullet to you is worth more than the lives of my Indian brothers. And you have this aim, shoot, fire, shoots Ray Stevenson in the heart with this thing. And it's, oh, it's so good. So fucking good. And you know what's interesting, Brian? Like, I if feel- it wasn't like eleven o'clock at night when I watched it, I would have clapped. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, no, but it, it's yeah. it's so fulfilling. You know what I mean? But what is interesting is that I feel like the English, because they've had a nation much, much, much longer than us, um, have an understanding of the blood on their hands the way that Americans like freak out about that i would imagine and i've not done any research on this whatsoever so i'm kind of talking on my ass i guess i'm saying i'm assuming um is that the english probably are not really offended that much by this movie where i feel that if this was on um, the american equivalent of this you know, all the daily wire people would be shitting their ass over this, but I bet the English are actually pretty chill about it. They're like, yeah, mate, we know our history, (laughs) whatever. I I mean, I think, I think that, I think that there is some truth to that because I think one of the things that as Americans, we have a problem dealing with is recognizing our own horribleness in our history And that might be, maybe that is because we have been, we are a much younger nation than other nations. Like the British empire has been around for centuries, Mm -hmm. you know? So like they've been around longer, they've done more horrible things. Um, And that's not just saying to the Indian people that's saying to people in Africa, that's saying to people in the middle East, saying to uh, the Americans, that's saying to just about everybody, a lot of people in Europe, yeah, a lot of people in Europe, you know? Um, (laughs) So, I mean, they, they kind of have no choice, but to recognize their own history. Um, And I, I think that though, I would not be surprised if there is some element that maybe does not see it nearly as bad, you know? And I only go back to that because I know when, when Queen Elizabeth passed away, uh, there were people who were cheering her death. Another one bites the dust. Yeah. So, I mean, that was something that people were like, well, how dare you? And it's like, but do you realize like what happened under her reign and under her father's reign? And it's, and I think that's, that's part of it is that, as much as we like to think that, oh yes, there we're we're more evolved and we have more we're, we're much better now, that yeah. you still have to recognize that history is not always kind to your side, you know, and you know there are still horrible things that happen in your history that you have to acknowledge. I think that's what anyone wants is acknowledgement that things were not always great back then. Yeah. Or at least an even an even understanding of it, you know, like for for American audiences. And this is going to be a very, very short tangent. Like you can talk about the importance of George Washington and the Revolutionary War and him being the first president. But you also have to talk about that the man was a vile, sadistic, slave owning maniac. And you don't have to phrase it that way if you're talking to children. But you have to show 
both sides of a coin or else it's propaganda. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, Now, I did want to talk a bit about one issue that I did have with this movie, and it's mostly having to do with the female roles in the film. Okay. Um, And it's mostly just that I, I felt that the female roles like Jenny and Sita really weren't developed enough in comparison to say Raju and beam um, in the film, you know, Jenny has a subplot in which she's kind of the love interest to beam. And really she's just kind of there at, for the, com- the entirety of the film, just to really give, you know, beam a way into the prison to rescue Raju. But we never see anything come from that relationship. You know, there's never any kind of resolution to it. We do kind of get like the beginnings of it, the middles of it, because obviously the dance number is part of it. And then, you know, just kind of one little scene that kind of like locks it in. But there's no completion to it. With Sita, unfortunately, Sita, I for me, I felt reading this movie that she was just there to provide exposition for Beam about who Raju is. And uh, I mean, I don't know how you could expand those characters more. And I think it's also worth mentioning that this movie really isn't about them, but I did find that there was a lack of development in those characters. John, your thoughts. I I tend to agree with you. Um, You know, the, the old trope of like sexy lamp. Um, I, I don't I don't think they're necessarily sexy lamp, but I think it's just like these the characters action. could do more. Yeah, that's no, exactly. what I felt. I think that there, there may be twofold to it is that this is absolutely a story about bromance and they wanted to focus entirely on that. Um, but also, I don't I don't pretend for a bloody second that I'm any type of expert on uh, Indian films whatsoever. But uh, so this could just be par for the course. But I think that this is almost kind of like. And I could be dead wrong, an homage to like 80s action films where women didn't really have much to do other than to be the main characters, loved ones. And again, I could be so far off course i don't even know but i think that that possibly could be where they were going but also that they are yes they are lacking that they should have for all the machismo in this movie maybe give your women in the movie more to do than just long and lust and be you know bright-eyed i mean it it, it's i i mean i've seen Worst representation of women in films. Oh, sure. In this one. And that's, I want to, I want to bring that up here is that I don't think that, that these characters were represented horribly compared to American films. Cause we have a tendency in America to really like, you know, miss the eight ball right there on that front. Um, Jesus Christ. And you don't have to go back to the eighties for that one. Yeah. Um, more like go back, like, I don't know, uh, six months. Um, yeah. but <laughs> Looking at you, Madam Webb. Um, but you know, I I just felt that with such a great movie like RRR, that's one area that I felt was lacking. That I would have liked to have seen some development further is with characters like Jenny and Sita. Um, not so much Molly because I know why Molly's there. You know, is she, but there's even with her, like some little bit development of those characters so that they're also part of this very rich story that has so many twists and turns and really captured me. And I know captured you, John. So like, that was the only, if I could pick one thing, like this is the one thing I would say I I would fix. That's it. Mm -hmm. All in all, it's a brilliant film. And I understand why my brother told me to watch it. I understand why, you know, so many people have fallen in love with this movie and why it has like a 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, even though I don't give Rotten Tomatoes much credit. It's a brilliant film and it ha- it does it does what hollywood should do which is make movies that grab audiences 
And it's not necessarily grab audiences with nostalgia. It's not grab audiences with popcorn. It's just grab audiences in a way that keeps them locked in. Yeah. You know, pay, pay attention, Hollywood. Watch RRR and maybe you'll learn something. Well, I think that the, the pitch channel also said like, oh, yeah, take this and then remake it for American audiences. Please don't do that. I'm sure they will to some very Please, for yeah. the love of God, don't do that because that would fail. I don't think it's so going to be so hard. I don't think it would be like an exact like shot for shot remake, but I think that they would just do the American version of it. Just please, for the love of God, don't do that because yeah. it, it misses so much. I think there is something to this culture, the, the, the people of this culture, the Indian culture, the, being the ones who are authoring this. Yeah, you know, true. They and have it, an experience that is in the film. And we share well, in the film. And we've never been, quote unquote, like conquered by anybody. So I don't know what the American version would be. Oh, I'm sure they would just do like the Patriot. Me, yeah, the that's, Revolutionary War kind yes, of thing. Yeah. That's what they would do. That's <laughs> oh, what they would fuck do. you, England. We're at you again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. This, yeah. I, I was blown away by this film. Uh, I'm glad we got to do it. Um, and I hope that anyone who hasn't seen it checks it out. It's on Netflix. Um, so if you've got Netflix, it's readily available. Um, it is a three hour watch. So just know that going in. But I'll say two things about that. One, it doesn't feel like three hours. Absolutely not. As much as I love Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm like that. I felt the time in that movie. Um, but it doesn't feel like three hours. But also, it's motherfucking Netflix. You're in your goddamn house. You got to take a piss. You can pause the motherfucker. You know, you want to make some soup, take a dumpski. You have the freedom. You can pause it and come back to it. So, uh, yeah, don't let the, t the runtime freak you out because you're in control. Yeah. 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 No, totally. Totally. Love the movie. Uh, with that said, John, where can they find you at on the Internet? Uh, Twitter. Facebook. <laughs> Instagram. I'm never calling it X. I'm oh, like that. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and you can find me over at J Does Video Nasties, where I am currently putting the the polish on my script for uh, so many questions. Demolition Man. Uh, I love that so much that I'll be I'll be shooting that pretty soon. Here, there's no greater definition than '90s cheese than Demolition Man, baby. Awesome, awesome. So uh, for for me, you know. Um, I want to first ask that if you like this podcast, okay, um, that you do me a favor. One, I want you to tell someone about it. I really do. If you love movies, if you have a friend who loves movies, tell them about this podcast. You know, um, on top of that, if you haven't done so, go ahead and go to cinemapsychoshow.com forward slash follow and follow us on your favorite podcast platform of choice. I've got buttons literally there that you can click and immediately subscribe to the show so you can listen to it wherever you want. And if you're on YouTube, if you're watching to us on YouTube, do me a favor, hit the subscribe, hit the follow button, hit the notification bell. That way you never miss a new episode when we comes out. And with that said, we will see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>